So I attended one of those financial seminars that they offer to teach you about the importance of a 401k. I've had so much time to kill at home lately. Ever since my job got furloughed, I've been searching every jobs board I can find and for any tip on how to make money and how to save it. I went down one of those rabbit trails on Google, you know what I'm talking about, where I searched how to pay off mountains of debt and after watching more than 30 minutes of videos on YouTube, I ended up signing up for a seminar. They were talking about how compound interest and how you can build wealth over time just by squirreling a little bit of money away every month. Apparently the Italians thought it up in the 17th century and then Wall Street perfected it in our times and everyone should take advantage of it. I like the thought. Say you deposit $200 into an account at a certain percent. That money collects interest and then the interest collects over time. Don't worry, I'm not here trying to sell you a mutual fund. I don't even have one myself. I have four years of student loans to pay off and my car payment, and I'm definitely no financial wise. But the concept is appealing. Say you deposit $200 into the mutual fund at a decent rate of return. And you do that for every month for 30 years? Voila! You're a millionaire! <laughs> it's an awesome idea, right? Guess how I felt though, after a sales pitch. Here I am, without a job, a big pile of debt, I'm wishing that before I'd leased a car, someone had taught me about money in high school and had told me to put the car payment into a mutual fund instead. As you can imagine, I started to feel a bit discouraged. There's nothing like having a lot of time on your hands, a search engine on your smartphone, and time aimlessly surfing the internet. I've never really done this before, but I was feeling so down and decided to type four letters into the search bar. Can you guess what they were? H-O-P-E. Where can I find hope? It's kind of embarrassing because I know where. <laughs> I didn't find hope in my Google search, I can tell you that. But as I walked to the verge of self-condemnation and regret, wishing I had a job that had been smarter with my money, I stopped my little pity party and walked out the door for some fresh air. I found myself at the mailbox. To my surprise, the Christmas card from my grandma had arrived. Just like every other year, a sweet little note with $10 in it. And the front of the card said, Hope of the World. When I turned it over, the inside was a drawing of Mary holding the little baby Jesus and that verse from Luke. But Mary treasured up all these words, pondering in her heart what they might mean. And I stood there, in the snow, without a jacket on, holding the card and the envelope in one hand, with the $10 bill in the other. I looked up at the sky, and I had to laugh. Snow was falling around me. In those, you know, those big fat flakes that are as big as dove feathers. And I suddenly felt like the richest person in the world. Right then and there, I repented and asked God to forgive me for getting so discouraged about my circumstances when his son and his spirit live right inside me. What a treasure there is here in this little heart of mine. Mary treasured up all the things that God was doing in her circumstances in her heart. This miracle of a sorry that God sent his only son into the world, born of a woman. Born as a baby to live a perfect life and set us free from sin and despair. Wow. This miracle of the story has been treasured in hearts like Mary's ever since the day Jesus was born. And since Luke wrote down his gospel and the words were passed along through the centuries, just think of the compound interest that's accumulated in the hearts of believers. Oh, the riches of the glory of God in all of us, in this world. As I stood in the snow, and believe me, I was starting to get cold, I had this desire to just store it up, to let the truth of God multiply and grow so that my whole heart becomes a reservoir of hope. Let it compound and accumulate. But friends, I have to tell you, I felt something else so deeply. Like my grandma, who by the world's standards has very little, but gives so much, so that her $10 gift every year feels to me like 10000 we must not hoard all this hope to ourselves. Spend it. Give it away. The world needs it. If you and I, believers in God, get discouraged in these days, how much more do those who don't yet know him need hope? Go. Tell it on the mountains. Shout it from your rooftop. Ponder the wonders of God's truth. And as the wealth and riches build up inside of you, give that hope away. I had a dream, and when I woke, I felt like I needed one of the great men or women of faith from the past to help me understand it. 
In the same way that Joseph helped Pharaoh perceive that there would be seven good years of harvest, followed by seven years of famine. But there were no rivers and there were no cows. It was just me standing there in the middle of a desert. My fingers were blistered. My skin was hot from the sun. My lips were cracked and I was thirstier than I can ever remember. I wanted to cry, but it was so dry, I didn't have any tears. And then I heard a few words whispered on the wind. They made the hair stand up on my arms as a cool breeze swept across my body. I woke up right then because the feeling was so real, so startling. Sitting up in my bed, I think I understood what it must have been like for Elijah to hear the voice of God on the mountain after the earthquake and the fire and the wind. The words stuck with me like they were written across the bedroom wall. The wrapping paper, scissors, and tape from my late night session of gift wrapping were still sitting there on the floor. What were the words whispered in the dream that so startled me? Drink deeply from the river of my delights. Drink deeply? From where? There was no water in sight. And I just found myself wishing that I could make a time machine and travel back to the Egyptian Empire and find Joseph in this prison cell to ask him what it meant. And the answer came, just like that. The same way the wind blew and startled me in my dream, the gentle voice of the Spirit. The desert is where we're at, where we've come from, what we're walking through. It was a tough year, a dry one. I've felt depleted. To be honest, more depleted than I've ever felt in my life before. I've been, we've been through a desert, haven't we? There was more loneliness and uncertainty, more confusion and anger and more fear than most of us have ever felt. And it hit us all at once. Some of us were prepared with sunscreen and a week's worth of supplies. Some of us didn't even bring a hat. I know, I know. It feels weird to be thinking about deserts as our minds are turning toward all the things of Christmas, snow and ice eggnog and cold. It's weird to be talking about a desert, but you know what feels even stranger? To prepare for the Christmas season. For many of us, it'll be strange, lonely, dry. I mean, can you even smell gravy over Zoom? It's exactly the moment when you need your family the most. And for so many, we may not be able to even give a hug to our loved ones. Kiss a sweet new baby sing carols out of tune at the top of our lungs together, open gifts, laugh. Wrapping gifts last night, I was just going through the same motions, pulling out the same decorations, planning the same traditions as every other year, but with none of the feeling. It hasn't been joyful, it's been dry. Like my burnt lips in the dream, like the scorched and sandy ground I was standing on. And yet the still small voice whispers, drink deeply, where and from what? His spirit, my friends, God's sweet and refreshing spirit. If I learned anything from this difficult season, it's that you can never have enough. Enough toilet paper in the hallway closet, enough canned goods on the pantry shelf. There aren't enough batteries in the world to get us out of the darkness. My own strength, my own faith, my own habits and traditions, no matter how good they are, they're simply not enough. And even though I may be in a dry and weary land, there is a river that never runs dry. I had to be reminded, maybe even warned in a dream, that from this river I can never get enough. I must run to it, go back to his spirit, drink deeply, and do it all over again. Today I'm lighting the candle of Advent as a reminder that even in a desert, God refreshes me. Even in the darkness, his light shines. No matter what we feel, by his great mercy, we can find the joy of God again. So let us go to him. Drink deeply and no true joy.
Our daughter started a tradition years ago of buying us a decoration made by a local sculptor who creates scenes of the nativity out of clay. Whenever I look at our Christmas tree, it's like I'm looking at every part of the Christmas story and the history of our family get-togethers, both at the same time. I was staring at the Christmas tree the other night, squinting up at it from the floor, and a question came to me. Have I taken the shape you want me to take? Those words fell like an exhausted mind from where I lay on the floor after a long day. You see, I used to say a prayer quite often when I was younger, as the direction of my life wasn't so clear, when there were more years ahead of me than behind me. I was in the habit of praying, God, you are the potter and I am the clay. Please shape me. This was when I had yet to choose the path, the university I'd study at, the career I'd pursue, my spouse. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm no Scrooge bemoaning a Christmas past and all that could have been. When I was looking at all those clay ornaments, it triggered this memory of me when I was unformed, ready to be made into something, yet to be tested and strengthened through fire. That prayer over the years became more of a declaration. I will take the shape my father will have me take, for he is the potter and I am the clay. I believe it still, with all my heart. But this lump, and let's be honest, lumpy clay, has been shaped. I live, act, walk in a certain way, and I have for years. That hopeful, prayerful statement I declared when I was young, well, it was before this strange time we're living in, before our world ground to a halt and the virus hit, before they sort of just shut down and canceled everything in a way that's still impacting me and so many people I know. Like my daughter, who cried over the phone, when she called us to tell us that she won't be sending a little clay decoration this year because the sculptor couldn't reopen after the quarantine. So last year's little clay shepherd boy was the final one. That prayer of faith I prayed all those years ago, is it cancelled too? I prayed it before this cynical time when politics and conversation weren't so toxic and angry where you could have a civil chat with relatives from the other side of the country, those who vote for the other party at Thanksgiving. Remember that? It seems that when I prayed that old prayer, it was in much simpler or hopeful times. So there I am, laying on the floor. The tree is decked out and twinkling, but it just didn't look the same. The feelings, the expectations I normally have at Christmas weren't there. Then I started looking around the living room at all the things in it, Stuff gathered up over a lifetime. Furniture and bookshelves, trinkets, souvenirs, picture frames and coffee mugs and plant holders. All these practical and decorative things. I had to chuckle. God, you've shaped me. Now, God, please use me. Sometimes at Christmas, I just want to think about the baby in the manger. Some years, I'm part of a big choir or in the big church play. This year, I feel a bit more tired than usual. And I'm not all that certain if we should have even put up the tree. But whether I'm standing with my arms raised in worship or laying on the living room floor, I know that the God I serve is the God who both shapes me and uses me. He's the God who cleans and polishes me. He repairs and restores me. He is the potter. I am the clay. And he holds me in his hand. I don't know if we'll have a big turkey dinner this year with all the trimmings or order pizza and eat it on the couch. But I do know that my God is the God who can fill this empty vessel with grace. A grace that isn't based on a feeling or on my circumstances, but on the very nature of who he is. A gracious God who gave his only son to the world to save it from despair. And so this year I choose to light a candle at Advent to declare that God has filled the world and my life with grace. This is a phone. You've probably seen it before. It's a calendar and our calculator. It's a window into a thousand other worlds, a camera and a notebook, a map and a search engine, a personal assistant, and if we're honest, a companion that you probably interact with more than any other individual in your life. You cast your morning workout from it and then listen to the morning podcast. It counts your steps and all the calories that you've burned. It beeps to remind you to take your pill and to notify you that the package that you ordered is now at your door. 
It times how long to boil your eggs in the morning and serves as an alarm clock to wake you up and drag your too tired body out of bed. It's in your hand and in front of your eyes before you finish your morning coffee and you've probably looked at it a dozen times before you crack open the hard boiled eggs and sprinkle them with salt and pepper and ketchup or hot sauce. Where you go, it goes. You might text the traffic lights, tweet from the bathroom, or comment in between bites of your meal. Power walking while talking loudly on the speakerphone, it's got all the apps you'll ever need. You can order your dinner or your groceries, hail a ride, close the garage door, set up a blind date, look up a word, book a hotel, leave a review, read a book, or binge watch almost anything. And we haven't even got to Instagram or Facebook yet where you can scroll and scroll and scroll for days on end, where you can let yourself get lost in the maze of funny memes or hilarious gifts and laugh at comments from friends that you haven't seen since high school. Let your jaw drop at sensational news stories and for some reason, even though you know better, you click and click and click until your blood pressure is high and your sugar level is low. Before you know it, it's almost lunchtime and you shake yourself out of that scroll and juice coma only to remember that the whole reason you went to your phone in the first place is to open the Bible app and read the scripture of the day. And then your mother is texted twice and she started to use emojis. This is my phone. It goes everywhere with me and I go everywhere with it. I stand in line at the bank or I wait for the nurse to call my name. I consult with it while watching movies or having dinner with family and friends while I walk the dog, or if I'm in meetings at work. It's my connection to the world, and yet, it disconnects me from the world, from myself, and from God. Not always, but if I'm honest, a lot. It does most things for me, except it doesn't give me peace. This is a phone, and you are allowed to turn it off, to put it down, and to leave it on its own. There is a difference when we stop, when we unplug, when we turn off our pixels and turn to the light. Let's take a moment, let's close our eyes, take a deep breath in and exhale. When was the last time that you felt deep, quiet peace? God keeps in perfect peace anyone and everyone who fixes their mind on him. This Christmas, let's turn our heart and our attention to Jesus who came as the light of the world that we may truly know peace. Let's tune out the world a little more, put down the phone, and tune into God. How do you keep a fire burning? You feed it with fuel to burn. During Advent, we light candles to symbolize that Jesus is the light of the world. Today, as we prepare our hearts for Christmas, let our hearts be aflame with love for Christ, and let that flame burn brightly through giving thanks. Many of us face challenges in different areas of our lives, our families, our health, our relationships at work and at home. No matter what we face, we thank God for healing us, for strengthening us, and encouraging us. Thank you that you are always with us, and that you always lead and guide us by your spirit and through your word. Thank you for your word, God. Thank you that you, Jesus, have made a living way to be right with the Father through your advent and birth, through your life and your death, through your resurrection. Thank you that we have access to your word, written down to the centuries, which is always available to us to guide and instruct us in the way that we should go. Today we rest in you, God, and we activate our faith. We believe in you. We trust you. We long for your presence and to walk in your ways. Thank you that you go before us, that you lead and guide us. Thank you for your comfort. Thank you for your empowering grace and for your constant provision. Thank you that you make all things new, God, that your word never returns to your void, and that it does a new thing in us, around us, in our hearts, in our lives. Thank you that we are taking the shape you want us to take, because you are the potter and we are the clay. We thank you that you can do anything and that nothing is impossible for you. 
Thank you for your patience with us. Thank you for your commitment to us, for your undeniable, immeasurable, and indescribable track record of faithfulness and generosity toward us, of breakthrough and grace. We are so blessed to belong to you. Thank you for loving us first. Thank you for not giving up on us, for calling us into your kingdom of light, truth, and hope. Thank you for changing us and renewing us day by day. Thank you for every answered prayer in our lives, too many to count. Thank you that we live in a realm of answered prayer. Our homes, our church, our families, and success are built upon answered prayers. Thank you for protecting us and directing us. Thank you for nurturing us and that your deep calls to our deep. Thank you for searching our hearts and convicting us of sin. Thank you for cleansing us and correcting us, for counseling us and consoling us. Thank you that you are who you say you are and that you do what you say you will do. Thank you for letting us approach you and for receiving us. We love you, God. We truly love you. Everything that we have is because of you. All our hope is in you. Jesus, we stop in the busyness and complexity of our lives, no matter what situation we're in, no matter what we face or fear, we stop and in this moment, we acknowledge that because of your life, we live. Because you came to earth, we can be accepted and made whole by the Father. Today, our hearts burn with love for you. And so we light a candle of Advent as a symbol of this love that you've given to us, that burns in us. We are fueled by your love, and we fuel our hearts with thanks for all that you've done. Today, we find our passion and love for you all over again, God as we thank you and fix our attention on who you are. 